So every year, Google does their usual keynote addresses where they bring out various features and technologies onto the market. And this year was no different. So just recently, they had a Google Keynote address where we saw them talk about a lot of AI tools that they are bringing onto the system, onto the market. And we are going to discuss a few of them, try to understand the various ways that our lives will be impacted by all of these AI tools. And so uh, my name is Randy E.T., and this is the Contemporary Science Podcast Show, where we discuss all the scientific projects, technologies, and trending news across the world. I'm here with my co-host. Hi, yeah, I'm the co-host, uh, Sean Murphy. All right. Uh, so uh, I watched the keynote address just uh, a few days ago, and I would say my general opinion about it is the usual Google style address where they, I, I think they set the bar high in how they do these addresses, the presentations, all of these things. Uh, I, I find it very interesting and I like to watch it. Although like I, I didn't watch the live events because I was at work. I watched just a snippet of it there. Mm-hmm. I had to come back and watch later. But yeah. what, what, was your general overview of the entire presentation and all of the things they talked about? I thought it was good. I think, I mean, a lot of the stuff that they revealed is really cool, um, and we'll get into that, but there is, um, the way that they do it, it's really scripted, obviously, which mm-hmm. I completely yeah. understand Yeah. Um, because you're covering so much information and you want to make sure that information is conveyed in a clear way but sometimes when I'm watching it it's it's not that it gives me a feeling of like what else is behind the scenes but it's just like they're clearly presenting it in a very positive light which all these things have very positive uh aspects to them but I think for a lot of people there are some scary sides too Mm -hmm. um yeah. So yeah, there, there's. It's like fun to watch, but it's also very scripted and just like. Well, yeah. you could you could see that. Yeah. When you, if you are watching closely, you could see that uh, every person that walks in to talk about the or present one technology or the other, you could see that they are following a script. It's mm-hmm. like well rehearsed. Yeah. Something that has been in the making for the last 12 months, right? Yeah. And so the presenters themselves, you could see that, yeah. But generally, uh, I feel, when so when I watched it, I saw so many, uh, I saw so many media persons sitting down there. You could see them sitting down there in their suits and all of that. And looking back at the previous years, I mean, COVID came in and it changed everything, mm. right? And COVID changed a lot of things. And I'll go, uh, I'll just talk about just how they did the past Google Keynote addresses from, say, 2020. So in 2020, they could not have one because of COVID. Obviously, we know what happened in that Mm -hmm. year. It was canceled. But in 2021, they had it. And it was also very nice. Like, in terms of presentation, Yeah. in terms of... uh, the gravitas around it, the expectation that they create around it, it's so nice. So they had the outside, they had a few people. So in 2021, uh, the main theme or things they talked about were Google Meets, Google Maps, Google mm-hmm. Photos, AR, and Android. So like yeah, their devices and uh, the Google Kit, I would call them, that they talked about in 2022 is their flagship devices. And so we had, they talked about the Pixel 8, 6A, Pixel Buds Pro, Pixel 7, Pixel 7 Pro, the Pro, the Pixel Watch, Pixel Tablet. And this year, it was mainly on AI. Yeah. A lot of these AI tools. And we will come to like, the meat of what they discuss or the presentation, but what do you make of the trend that we are seeing right now? 
and mm-hmm. where it is going. Like with regards to artificial intelligence taking over the news, it's like <laughs> there's not uh, nothing else happening in the world apart from artificial intelligence. Yes, no, it is interesting. And as you were just as you were kind of going through the mm-hmm. keynotes there, I had the thought of like, I wonder if it because it's it's wild how. Um, rapidly things change. Mm-hmm. I wonder how early they have these planned out. Yeah. Um, because like the 2021 keynote, as you said, it's it was like a lot of the Google suite stuff, mm-hmm. which in response to the pandemic makes sense because everybody's working from home, yeah. you know, all that stuff. So I wonder if they had planned to to really focus on Google Meet and stuff like that, or if that was in response. And, and now with AI, I'm wondering if they were already working on this stuff or if they're really being driven by what OpenAI did. Yeah. And I see a lot of other companies also springing up with different AI tools. Yeah. Like every day there is a new AI tool. Yeah. And you ask yourself... Just like what you are wondering, when did they start planning this? Yeah. Was it already in the works? Was it? But I feel it's been coming. Mm -hmm. Because we've been talking about AI, not, uh, well, we are seeing the products today. But we've been talking about AI for like, I would say the last 10 years. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, by working with all of these tech companies, with inside information, they know that, okay, uh, this company is working on something. Mm -hmm. This company is working on something. So we should also begin working on something. Mm -hmm. But the, it just turns out that you can't gauge the impact of one company's tool. And so say you are open AI and you release yours onto the market, chat GPT, Mm -hmm. When I see that, I'm also working on, on uh, my AI tools and uh, devices. But once I see yours and I see the impact it's making, it forces me exactly. to, to try to hit that standard or do better than you. Yeah, I guess exactly. that is what we are seeing now. Yeah. I think the unique thing about what um, OpenAI did and then now what's, what Google is doing, I think like when an iPhone comes out... Mm-hmm. I feel that they are releasing a product that they've had in the bank for a few years. Yes. OpenAI has been work in Google too. They've been working on these AI tools for a really long time, but their hand was forced like recently. Yes. yes. So now they're not releasing things that they've been developing for years and years. They're like updating it as they go. It seems like it seems like this sort of frenzy that's going on is a little bit more like not so planned. Like they're really having yeah. to get after it, probably in a different way than they usually would. Yeah, and I can't agree with you more on that. Uh, I see even the tools that they were uh, bringing out, you could see that some of them are not in the stage where it's ready to receive users. Yeah. We, there's, uh, they have a lot of wait lists Mm -hmm. for almost all their tools. Yeah. So it's like just (laughs) presenting what they would release in the next few months. Not that they are ready to be used now. Yeah. I see uh, one or one icon when I open my Google Chrome, there's this beaker icon. Yeah. yeah, The lab. Yes. You click on it and you have to join a wait list. Yeah. Even with BAD, even Palm 2, and we will get into that, Mm -hmm. but all of these are still in the works. It's not like it's at the stage where it could receive users. Mm -hmm. I I guess it's just uh, because they have a set time where they've done it over the years, and so people in the industry are expecting it in this time. And as you said, there's a pressure on them to respond to all of these things happening. And we see Bing, and Bing, I I, I don't want to go much so much into that, but <laughs> Bing is becoming, is exploding, to be right. honest. Uh, is, 
it, they've been under the shadow of mm-hmm. Google for so long. And with AI, it's like they've been so empowered. Using big feels more enjoyable. Yeah. And so I feel at this time, Google has to respond. Yeah, exactly. They yeah, and, and it's, it's when I heard that Bing partnered with OpenAI mm-hmm. and is now using GPT-4 as their, like, yeah. to facilitate search and stuff, I was like, wow, that's a bold move mm-hmm. because yeah. not only is GPT a competitor of Google, but now Bing, which is an actual search engine, because mm-hmm. GPT-4 is, I feel, more of a tool. It's less of a search engine. You can mm-hmm. use it as a search because yeah. it has so much data, but now that they're actually in conjunction with a search engine, then ex- you're exactly right. Google's probably going like, oh, snap. Yes. We really yes. have to push the yes. limit, which is a little scary because that's when mistakes happen. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, one thing I uh, just realized, I noticed it might have gone under the carpet. A lot of people might not have noticed it. And I'll mention that in passing before we get to the actual products that Google um, talked about in the keynote is virtual reality. Mm-hmm. In the last year, in the last two years, we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of people talk about virtual reality, all the things that virtual reality is going to do, the prospects. And Mark Zuckerberg, I, 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 he, might, he might not have come out to see explicitly, but he's mentioned the power of, uh, of virtual reality and how virtual reality, with, together with augmented reality, could transform everything. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we have artificial intelligence and no one is talking about virtual reality anymore. No. Nobody. Yeah. And I'm like, so what happened? (laughs) Like, (laughs) it's it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. I think a big part of it is that, and I don't even think, like, I think probably the developers at OpenAI were probably a little bit more aware of how capable their product was. Mm -hmm. But even when you talk to, even when you listen to like Sam Altman, who is Mm -hmm. kind of like part of the founder team of OpenAI, and then you listen to some really intelligent people talk about what Google's doing, there's like the smartest people Mm -hmm. are saying that they don't even fully understand how powerful this stuff is yet. And so I think with Op- or with these artificial intelligence, um, or as they like to say, like AGI, artificial mm-hmm. general intelligence, um, word language processors, I don't, it, like they work so good that the public is like blown away. We weren't expecting that. And like to the untrained eye, I think to some people it seems like, oh my gosh, this is like conscious. It's yeah. obvious it's not. Yes. Um, to somebody who's like understands how to work with it, it's it's way far from consciousness. But I think the general public is going like, "Wow, this is scary! How crazy this is!" Mm-hmm. But with artificial reality, it's it just isn't there. It's it's very animated. It's you know yeah. so. Yeah, and uh, just thinking about that a bit, I recently reviewed. Uh, Ray Hoffman's book, uh, Impromptu Amplifying Our Humanity Through Artificial Intelligence. And in the review of the book, he mentioned some of the fears of people, as you mentioned, the thought that it's self-aware, mm. right? And we, it's when you understand it very well, you realize that it's just so much data yeah. and training of yes. a neural system, <clears throat> yes. an artificial neural system mm-hmm. or networks that makes it work in that way. Yeah. And it's based on the design that the engineers put together to make it respond that way. Yeah. And so generally, the fears of people are not unfounded. They are founded. And we'll get into that a bit in, in later part mm-hmm. of uh, discussions, but I would like us to begin talking about some of the 
tools that Google released. The first one among them is BAD. Mm -hmm. And BAD has already been in the system uh, before this keynote. It's just a few months ago when GPT-4 came out. And as we were mentioning earlier, it's like a response to to OpenAI. And we've seen several others. I've seen Cloud. It's called Cloud or Cloudy. I don't know how it's mentioned. That is also a large language model that also works just like ChatGPT. And we see a lot of them springing up. But what Google, uh, the innovation they are putting into this is to make it very useful to creators and developers. Yeah. And so one thing they talked about was uh, putting in these uh, code generation stuff that you could write codes. And it has about 20 plus programming languages. I don't know how many programming languages are out there. But if I'm a developer and I see 20, yeah. 20 plus <laughs> programming languages, I'm like, man, I yeah. should have this stuff. Yeah. I should have this stuff. Yeah. No, I, when I was watching the keynote and um, the, I think it was a woman dis- that was talking yes, about this. Part. Yes, yes. Um, when she was discussing these things, <clears throat> I was like, wow, that's really impressive. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, like, exactly what you said. If I, especially if I'm like a young developer mm-hmm. and maybe I have some skill, I would be think like even I don't know programming, but even just looking at the potential that Bard has, I'm thinking like, wow, imagine how like exponential your skill could be yes. with this because yes. you can ask it questions like, how would I do this? Or you could say a line of code and as she describes, she's, you know, can you write that in a different way or can you exp- can you break down what this code is doing and it's and crazy it, it, it does that and it goes line by line to explain to you <laughs> what each line of code means yeah and so if you are trying to as you said if you're a young developer someone just getting into the world of coding mm-hmm. and you have your hand on bad man you could do a lot yeah you could do a lot. And uh, one other thing I learned um, when during the presentation was that aside the generation of code, they could also cite the code. Mm. So I got confused a bit. So I was like, <clears throat> so does it mean they copy the code from online, say GitHub or something, and post it there, or it generates the code? Uh, it becomes confusing. Like, why, if you are citing something, mm. then it means that there was an initial source, right? And so I got confused a bit. And so then it means that users of these codes that are generated on BAT would have to be careful in how they use it. Yeah. Right? Because if you are using something that is already like on the market or on outside there, you would probably be very careful using it, right? I I don't know what your thoughts about that is. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that it's able to do that um, because, like, I don't, I'm not super familiar with, like, um, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, like, programming etiquette. Mm -hmm. And if when you get to a certain level, you're sort of required to give credit or need to know where they were sourced uh, so not to cut you back, yeah, please. In, in the situation where you are just coding for uh, projects that you are doing by yourself, some mini projects, mm-hmm. you don't have to. But uh, for me, for instance, doing a PhD right. and trying to design something that will be published out there, designing, some, uh, putting together devices that will run on these codes, mm-hmm. I probably have to... Uh, sites where these codes came from. You could pick, like, the ideas, but if you pick the code itself, you would have to. Would have and to. I think, I th- just as you talking about that, I think the key probably is that, you know, if you're not writing the code yourself, because I'm sure there's people out there who are skilled enough to write majority of their code. Mm-hmm. Um, just um, on their own, but I'm sure as you get to certain levels, it's not, um, it, would, it wouldn't be an efficient use of your time 
to not use code, in which case you might want to go, you might want to have access to the source to see mm-hmm. what, if, if there's any explanation that they have, um, you know, on their site about it, or if there's um, some bugs that you're having with that code, maybe you could find a solution by, by having access to wherever the source is. So I think that's really interesting and um, it's just a deeper level to what type of information is, is essentially, you know, BART is giving to you. Yeah. And one other very interesting tool the um, talked about was Palm 2. Mm-hmm. And Palm 2, it's so big. It's like this, the main system that BART works on, and they have different versions of it. And when I was listening, I was so intrigued when they mentioned that they could train the system just on security stuff. Mm. And they would call it SEC Palm 2. Yeah. And then on medical stuff, mm-hmm. they would call it Med Palm 2. Yeah. And I find that so interesting. Yeah. No, I found that really interesting as well. And it's not, um, I, it's very encouraging, but it's also, le- it, there, I think the, the, not ch- it, there's a challenge and a little bit of a scary part where it's like if you're a student or if you let's say are a doctor or something and um, you're learning this information it's sort of wild that this power now that we have it, it instantly learns this information and can access it way faster than any human can. Yes. And so that's what's crazy. I don't think that it's going to eliminate jobs like a lot of people are afraid of. Mm-hmm. I think if you use it properly, it, it'll only amplify what you're yeah. able to do. Yeah. But it is wild that there's that much power like this med palm too mm-hmm. could act as a physician for certain, like, especially if you're like a general practitioner or something yeah. like and your patient gives med palm two symptoms, and yeah. then maybe med palm two says, "Okay, let's just do some blood work." It analyzes the blood work, yes. and then tells you, it. That's wild. I think the next step, and uh, Google may have their own plans, or uh, the tech giants may have their own plans. But I feel the next step would be uh, putting these t- tools and these features into the medical devices themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And so you don't just have a blood testing device to test my blood, but it has all these AI tools inculcated into the software such that when it picks a patient's blood, it doesn't just tell them, hey, um, this is what we are seeing. And then the laboratory technician or whatever just goes in and say, okay, based on these things that we are seeing, uh, we could say the person has is diagnosed of this or that. Mm-hmm. But it goes way beyond to make work so easy, yeah, so fast, yeah, convenient. Like so generally when I think about these things, things that uh, what intrigues me is thinking about what the future will look like. Yeah. And just five years ago, majority of us did not even know that we could be at a point where things are so possible. Yeah. And I would just um, bring that in. During the keynote, they mentioned that during their testing, uh, they, they, and one thing I noticed is that they, they tested most of these tools in ASU, Arizona State University. That was funny. I was like, where is this? (laughs) I'm like... (laughs) I want to be a part of this. (laughs) Yeah. And then for this particular med palm tool, they tested it in Harvard, Mm -hmm. aside the several tools that they tested in ASU. This was tested in Harvard Medical School, and they were able to use it to sequence over... uh, I, I, I forgot the number, but they said over 200 or so proteins. Yeah, the proteins. That would probably take 400 million years. Yeah. They said they did it in two weeks. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Like, so all of the possibility mm-hmm. of all of these things, 
do make people scared about it. And we'll talk about some of these things in a bit. Yeah. But, um, okay, so one thing that I found interesting uh, that I really commend Google for is uh, responsible AI. Mm. And responsible AI, the example they gave was like, you find an image and you want to find, say the image is circulating on the internet with some information on that image. And so you want to find when that image first appeared on the internet, how it was used, who posted it, what was the original information that was posted on it. And you could easily get that information using this new feature that they've included on their system. And it's not just um, pictures that were designed by people, but even AI uh, pictures or yeah. AI-generated pictures as well. And I find that really cool. Yeah. No, I I also find it really um, good. It's, it's really cool that they're putting an emphasis on that. I hope that... Um, I hope that that's not just like a PR thing. Mm -hmm. I hope that they're really, yeah. um, you know, taking that seriously because it is going to be an issue with, because these things, they look so real. Um, yeah. Whether it's an image or recently even on like my YouTube feed, how they have YouTube mm -hmm. shorts, I will see a video, but it's got some other famous person's voice and I'm listening yeah. and I'm like, this, they're not you saying think, this. Right. Yeah. So those, that type of stuff I think is really important because I do feel that like influential public figures should have some rights to their likeness mm -hmm. and what they say. Yes. Um, but also of course, you know, just images or disinformation that gets generated, there needs to be some way to filter that out. Yes, and and, and uh, it'll be nice if we see all the other companies also following suit. Yeah. Because right now, what they are doing only encompasses what is generated within the mm -hmm. confines of Google. Right. And so if I... Uh, we mentioned Bing just uh, yeah. a few minutes ago. If I go to Bing, I could not find that same information. Right. Right. Metadata about information that is circulating. Yeah. And in this day and age where these things that we are talking about are non-existent. Mm -hmm. So you see a picture of a man standing on the beach holding an umbrella, waving at something. It never happened in time. <laughs> right. It's something that was created. Yeah. And so if, and the way the design, the detail that comes with these pictures, and not just pictures alone, text and whatever it is, hmm. the way they are designed is so real, it's difficult to tell it apart from something that actually happened and was captured. Yeah. Right. And so to be able to find the source of these things, especially when... It's carrying some form of information that is critical or the information has an impact on society. It would be very nice to be able to find the source. Yeah. And I'm interested too, like with, so in terms of privacy, I think that this um, responsible AI will come into that as well. And, mm -hmm. and you mentioned privacy in the beginning. And I think that is going to be a critical piece as well because if it becomes commonplace for people to have these programs on their computer, mm -hmm. it there needs to be awareness for people. I think I think users need to take responsibility yeah. and understand like, okay, I can't, just because these things get put out, I definitely shouldn't be putting my personal information in there Mm -hmm. any sensitive materials, but also it's, it's, um, equally the response, like it's these parties who are producing these products, I think are equally responsible in terms of protecting people because it's just a reality that the common user is not going to be tech savvy enough yes. to understand yes. that yes. 
their information could be easily accessible because these systems are extremely powerful. Not even the designers of these tools understand them very well. Exactly. They, they, they have a fair idea of what they intend for it to do, mm-hmm. but to the extent that it does it and how it does it, yeah. we have no idea. Yeah. And so if, and having no idea about it, to some degree, shows how our inability to control what it can do. Yeah. Right. And so um, we talk about all of the uh, privacy issues that we will talk about in a bit. But going back to the Google Keynote, one other thing that uh, they mentioned, I think, close to the end of the the address was some of the the devices and the products that they are mm. bringing out. And slowly, Google is getting into the mobile phone industry. <laughs> yeah. Slowly. I see <laughs> they, they just recently, uh, re- it's not released yet. I, I, I haven't seen any of that online yet, but what I've seen, what they talked about was the Google Pixel Fold okay. and then the tablet. And yep. When I saw it, I was like, wow. So what what made me so intrigued about it is growing up when uh, we used to use Motorola's, mm-hmm. where we had those slide phones <laughs> and yeah, the yeah. flip phones, right? <laughs> yeah. And like, they were so cool, everyone wanted them. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Apple came with touch screens. And yes. Slowly, people like people moved from Blackberries and mm-hmm. these flip phones from Motorola and all of that, yeah. and moved to Apple because of the touch screens. Yeah. And after a few years, the flip phones and the slides and the folds were all gone. Yes. And Samsung managed to bring them back just in <laughs> recent years. And now we see Google also doing these folds and yeah. these flips. Now yeah. we have the f- uh, Pixel fold. And I'm yeah. wondering, is it a lack of, is it a lack of uh, innovation mm. or it's just a response of the public to these touch screens? Because, I mean, to these folds and the flips and all of that. Because now it's a little different from what it was back then because now... It's not just a fold, but it's a touch screen. Mm. So it makes it makes things a little easier. And uh, I'll just talk about Samsung a little bit, and then we'll move from there. So Samsung's uh, folds is like a mobile phone, a simple phone. But then when you open it up, it becomes a tablet. Okay. So you don't need to have a tablet like by yourself. You just need that. Yes. Once you get that, it doubles as a tablet. And so I don't know. It's interesting seeing these these things coming back into the system. Yeah. But I don't know what how the the public would react to this. You see this going very far, mm. or you see something else uh, coming in to like take over a game. <laughs> as we saw. Yeah. I don't. I mean, there's just no denying that Apple is still the leader. Yes. Um, yes. And I think that when these things get released, it's like a niche market. Um, Mm -hmm. But I do understand what they're trying to do in the sense of they know, like, look, we can't, people don't want to carry around. They can't put this size tablet in their pocket. So I completely understand, well, what if we can make it thin enough that even if it was folded in half, people would still feel comfortable putting it in their pocket or something like that. And because of how, like, ingrained the uh, media consumption is in everybody's life now, they're capitalizing on the desire for people to want a bigger screen. Mm -hmm. And so I understand it, but I just don't think that it's, I, I mean... It would be interesting to see what their sales are on something like that. Yes. And it would be interested to see, I would be interested to see how 
what's the longevity of the uh, actual display? Because just thinking about the logistics of a high high resolution display being folded like mm-hmm. that, I wonder in the folded folded part how long those pixels will hold up. Yes. So it's yeah. Yeah, and uh, just like I was mentioning earlier about innovation, I I just want us to move on a bit. So I have been thinking about uh, giving credence to what Google is doing so far. I realize that there's so much, looking back, there's so much innovation that we've seen in the tech space. It seems the tech space, compared to other industries, is the fastest moving. Yeah, absolutely. The fastest moving in everything. And once you have one uh, tech, uh, once you have a a tech tool or something coming up, Mm -hmm. it changes everything, right? Like. We have we have self driving cars yeah. coming up now, mm-hmm. and once they come up, they change. It, you see the rippling effect in several other industries. You have artificial intelligence coming up; it changes several other industries. <laughs> yes, and I look at Google over the years, and I say, man, just thinking about the keynote when I was watching it, I look at what they have done. And what they have done over the years, and I'm like, without Google, and I was looking at some of the Google kids, like uh, in the year where they were doing all just those things. I think in 2021, where they were doing Google Maps, Google Meets, Google uh, Workspace, like mm-hmm. Gmail, Google Drive, and all yeah. of that. I'm like, man, my life is solely dependent on all of these Google products. Truly, it's yes. And without them, in terms of, in terms of innovation, I would be like, so where would we have been, like, in terms of progress in innovation and all of that? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree, especially as a student, and then um, even in some of my own personal mm-hmm. business ventures, mm-hmm. I solely use the Google Suite yeah. to manage my email manage. Um, I do like, I personally prefer Google meet to zoom. Um, although zoom is great, but I still, I think because you can use Google meet and it's tied into everything. So you can have all your collaborators right there. They can bring, they can immediately put up a Google doc or a Google Mm -hmm. sheet or something like that. I think that it's, uh, I, I completely agree. Like, it's amazing what they've done. Um, and there are people who use, like, Microsoft Office Suite and stuff like that, but it's just not the same, in my exactly. opinion. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. When, when I use these, Google, these tools, I'm like... And you see a lot of the impact that Google has had when you pick people's laptops, right? Mm. And you see the number of tabs open on their Google Chrome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it tells you how much they have used it. Oh, yeah. Including me. Like, yeah. So yesterday I was at the lab and I was, um, I couldn't work out something on my laptop, so mm-hmm. I had to use my other lab mate's um, device. Yeah. And when he opened it up for me, I was like, whoa. <laughs> like, <laughs> he has so many tabs. Yeah. So many tabs. Yeah. And I'm not referring to like apps, just in Google Chrome. Yeah. So many. And when I look at all of this, is I, I think what uh, is fostering all of these improvements we are seeing and the growth we are seeing is the healthy, tech, uh, the healthy competition mm-hmm. yes. within this arena. The, the way these uh, companies compete against each other. We have Google, then we have Microsoft. Yes. You have, and not just in the U.S., like in U.K. and other places, you have all of these giants also doing marvelous things. You know? Yeah, and I just wanted to make a quick point or like an observation, which is that the people who are like... 
these companies are in competition with each other, but they're also leveraging the tools that mm-hmm. each one provides. Exactly. So I guarantee you that a bunch of people at OpenAI mm-hmm. use Google as their main operating system in terms of how they search, yeah. how they store data mm-hmm. in terms of documents and stuff. Yeah. I'm sure they have maybe different... They may have their own servers, though. They may have they, different yeah. stuff in terms of uh, managing a little bit more sensitive materials, mm-hmm. of course. But... That's what's so amazing is like Google allows, Google has allowed us to get to this point, just like Microsoft has allowed us to get to this point. Now we're at such a high level that they're all kind of the, they're all kind of, you know, having an upper hand here and then one has an upper hand here. So it's, it's just, that's what's so exponential, right? And, and. Yeah, so on that point, you realize that the greatest beneficiaries are we, the users. Mm -hmm. So we have all of these tools coming up, uh, the healthy competition that is happening. But at the end of the day, it makes my life better. Yeah. It makes the life of the general society better. Yeah. And that leads to the point I was about to make about the implication. Mm of all of these tools. And today we are talking about artificial intelligence and what Google has uh, done and the announcements they've made. And I look at the implication. And so we'll probably go deeper into what the fears of people are Yeah. regarding the power of artificial intelligence and especially these uh, large language models that are generating stuff. Yeah. So the question is, what, what is your take on what people are scared about mm-hmm. in terms of the sheer power that these AI tools have? And it's, it will only get better. I mean, like, they <laughs> yeah, exactly. only grow more powerful. Exactly. Right. You know, I think, I think there's a couple factors. I think one of the big factors, which is sort of a general factor, but it's still very important, especially in terms of just how we humans perceive the world, which is that especially modern humans, let's just take us Mm -hmm. since we're living right now, obviously, we perceive ourselves to be the highest in the food chain. There's up until this point, there's been nothing uh, since we've exited the uh, primitive world, let's say, there's been nothing that has sort of surpassed us in, in intelligence and mm-hmm. in, it, in capability. I think we're entering into a completely different um, sort of part of human experience, which is that there is now something that rivals our capabilities. Mm-hmm. And but because of that, the general population doesn't know how that's possible. And so the what what is scary is the unknown. It's the fear of the unknown. Mm-hmm. Because unless you're an AI programmer, you have no idea how this stuff works. Like I have no idea how the neural net is built. I have no idea what stage they're at, what they have that hasn't yeah. been released. So I think the fear of the unknown. And I think a big part, too, is like the job marketplace, which I would love to hear your take on that. Um, so those are a few of my thoughts just right off the bat. Yeah, and I, I perfectly agree with you. Like, we, 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 and some, some odd man, when I listen to him, Mm-hmm. The, the CEO of OpenAI, yeah. he, in one interview, he mentioned that it is sheer human arrogance mm. that makes us feel that nothing can surpass us in terms of intelligence. Yeah. So we know that or we feel that we are, more, we are the most intelligent species on it. Mm-hmm. And yet with our intelligence, it's difficult for us to fathom some things and solve some of our problems. Yeah. And we are now building by ourselves another intelligence. Yeah. 
that would compete with our own intelligence. Yes. And the fear of the unknown, just like you mentioned, is what makes it difficult for us to even comprehend how powerful it is Mm -hmm. and what it can do, given the fact that questions about control Mm -hmm. hasn't really been discussed. You know, when, when, and I would liken it to making a car, for instance. You make a car, you can turn it left, turn it right, you could speed up. But what makes you feel in control is your ability to stop when you want to stop. Yeah. To slow down when <laughs> you want to slow down. Right. And we don't feel that there is that brake pad when it comes to artificial intelligence. Yeah, that's. I think that's a great... Um, analogy or metaphor to Mm -hmm. explain it. Um, And what you said really is like the key point, which is that what's crazy about this whole process is that, you know, these AGI systems, they're, they're not quite there yet, Mm -hmm. but they're getting, they will be though. And, but what's really crazy about it is that it's born from us like all of its data is human data so it's not like humans are it's not like uh humans are less than or anything because all of its data is the cumulative human experience essentially Mm -hmm. and what we have discovered but what makes it so interesting is that it doesn't forget things because of the way it's designed, we've structured it in such a way that, uh, see, our brains, we take in data and we uh, aggregate and keep certain stuff, but then other things get pushed to the background. Less yeah. important things, things that we just don't have the capacity to remember for a long time without it, yeah. without practicing it. This doesn't have that. So, you know, I think that's really where we're going to, it's going to take uh, time to get used to, to yes. used to understanding like, wow, this thing is, functions different than we do. Yeah. And thinking about the way uh, it's working and how we are relating to it, I was talking to a friend just recently and he's, he's an upcoming musician and I was telling him about how AI is going to soon push him out of his job <laughs> because we are generating. Yeah. Like, AI now can generate <laughs> songs, lyrics, the beats, and everything. Right. And you could decide what um, musician's voice you want to use. Right? Yeah. And we've seen a number of them on the market. And his reply is what intrigued me. And I think uh, a lot of people should think about it in that way. So when I said this, he said, this will only make me more money. Mm, Yeah. Because by capitalizing on this, I would be able to do better music. Yes. And I'll become better. Yes. And when he said that, I was like, this is a good perspective Mm -hmm. to have. Yeah. So it then means that the way we react to these things or our relation to AI and all of these technologies that are coming up is based on the perspectives that we have. Yep. And Sam Altman mentioned, and he was called to the Congress, by the way, like to answer some questions. I think just yesterday or two days ago. And yeah, very recently. I'm yet, I'm yet to watch it. I have seen snippets online on YouTube and the rest, but I haven't watched it specifically i'll take time to watch it yeah but some of the snippets i saw was when he said that he does understand that some people would lose jobs Mm -hmm. right because of the power of ai and the things it can do yeah but then another thing he mentioned was that by the power and the capabilities of these tools and the things they are doing, human beings by our own creativity will be able to find things because we are so creative. Yeah. And it's our inability to, uh, or our fear to compete with these AI tools 
would be because of our inability to explore our creativity. Yeah. And so if you're able to explore your creativity, you will find so many things that you can do and using these AI tools will aid you to be better at those things. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And I think that's the perspective that we have to take because yeah. the, the fear is, is what's going to stifle us. Mm-hmm. And I think that just in turn, so I, I don't want it to, I don't want to make it all about money, but it's just a reality that we need money in this life yeah. to live a certain way. Yeah. And money allows, money is what brings people a lot of times out of, let's say, some level of suffering. Yeah. So I think that it's really important to have the perspective of, let me leverage this tool to my benefit instead of thinking, instead of just jumping to the conclusion that, oh, it took, it's going to take my job. Let me just not even try now because that's, that's just or fight it or fight it. Yeah. It's like, this is happening. Um, humans are still the most amazing thing. I mean, obviously yeah. we are what's creating this, yes. but I think if you take the positive perspective of like, okay, this is really interesting. Let me try to leverage this to my benefit. And that, as you say, the creative, uh, element of, mm-hmm trying to discover like, okay, wh- whatever I'm pursuing, how can I turn this into a tool that's only going to like, maybe it might even get you there faster if you just accept that it's that powerful. Yes. You know, so <clears throat> with the advancements in education, I think that, I think a couple things. So I think that AI is going to allow us to elevate our education in a, in a faster rate than it's currently going. And I think that children, um, I think children are capable of learning much more than our current system, Mm -hmm. um, operates. And so For example, with an AI system such as um, GPT-4 or BARD, I think what is going to allow for is a tailored, um, essentially a tailored education program for each student. So as the student um, goes through the process of learning, uh, let's say, arithmetic or or even if it's like an English or writing program, as the student progresses, it's going to be analyzing at what rate that student is capable of learning. Yeah. And then with that information, it's going to provide the optimal path to the uh, student's um, essentially peak learning capacity. And I think that humans, um, obviously, we're not able to process that type of information and put it directly into use the next day. So teachers, I think, I don't think teachers are going to be out of jobs. I think teachers are going to facilitate the process of, you know, making sure the students feel safe and comfortable. And, and then the teacher can be there for questions and the teacher can be there for all sorts of very important things. I think they should still be experts in the material. However, the AI is going to provide, I think, the next level to our learning process. And then with, you know, educating students or uh, boosting the education system of underdeveloped countries, I think that AI is going to be huge because I think AI is going to produce an influx of capital. I think money is, I think there will be more money produced through this. Mm -hmm. And I think that if that money is leveraged for these other countries, that those systems can then be put in place in these other countries where, you know, maybe the, the, the best access to teachers aren't there or whatever it may be. I think that these, 
systems will allow underdeveloped countries to kind of get out of that rut, so to speak, much faster than it would potentially be able to. So I think that in education, I th- in the education system, I think that um, these AGI systems are going to be um, really beneficial if leveraged properly. Yeah, yeah and, and uh, one more point about that is uh, the perspective teachers should take. And I have a friend in another university here in the U.S. I already mentioned the name, though. But he was talking about an assignment that he was given in class. And the professor explicitly mentioned that this assignment cannot be solved with ChatGPT. So don't bother using it. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. And when he said that, I was like, okay, well, then you have to find a way we'll of see, yeah. <laughs> But then the, the thought is, and coming back to what you were saying, teachers, I feel teachers should not be looking at trying to make the work difficult for students so that, uh, I mean, like difficult in the sense that they wouldn't be able to use these AI tools. Mm -hmm. Rather, it should be in a way that we could use these tools to improve understanding of concepts. So if these tools give you the opportunity to be able to understand what the assignment is or the concept is, then I think that is the best thing to do. So it shouldn't be whether we can use the tools or not. I mean, we should know how to use the tools, but we should use it towards that go to improve our yeah. concepts. No, I completely agree. And and I, uh, I I don't know if you have any last thoughts we are closing off mm-hmm. very soon. But uh, yeah, that is my thought around like education mm-hmm. and all of that. And there are several other uh, industries that AI could be used and would prove very beneficial and transformational in the entire economy. Yeah. My, my last thought would just be um, for whoever's listening, and I, I think especially, f- well, I mean, I, I was going to say especially for young people, but I think for anybody. Um, I think the only way, you know, if, you're, if there's fear around these things or if you're unsure of if this stuff is m- ethically correct or whatever it may be, I, I think that the only way to defend yourself and excel is to learn about it. And so I think if you have doubts about this stuff or if you're unsure or if you're just trying to see, like, how can how can I use these things to, uh, you know, excel in my own personal sphere, whether it's school, business, whatever it is, I think don't be afraid to start playing around with these things go on open AI, play yeah. around with chat GPT, research, mm-hmm. watch these Google keynotes, um, you know, listen to this podcast and other podcasts mm-hmm. about these things. Like the only way is to embrace that it's here and to learn about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I like what you said, like having an open mind mm-hmm. generally and being willing because it's here to stay yeah. generally. It's yeah. here to stay. And so those that are open to learning are those that would be able to transform the future. And so this is where we would close off. This is a contemporary science podcast show where we discuss interesting scientific and technological news going around on the internet. We talk about uh, technologies, breakthrough therapies, science projects that are making news over the internet. And so uh, if you are new here, please make sure you subscribe and listen to us on all your streaming platforms, wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, on YouTube, anywhere. And my name is Randy E.T., your host, and I'm here with... Yeah, I'm the co-host, Sean Murphy. All right. We sign up. Bye-bye. See you guys.